The Unshackled Waves, Episode 59. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms and this is our first ever economic show. Now this is a, another new format similar to how the In Focus and Philosophy show work uh, where we discuss a single economics topic for the entirety of the show and we discuss it with a guest who is a, an expert in economics. So our first guest for today is Steel Archer. He is founder of the Western Workers' Party, which is a, um, contrary to what the, what the name suggests, is a transnational organisation helping whites push back against cultural Marxism and globalism. Uh, his area of expertise is Austrian economics and demographic trends. We thought today, uh, because it is quite an interesting topic, that we talk about alt-right economics. Now, people in the alt-right are known for their stance against open borders, multiculturalism, and their concern for the plight of the, the white people. Uh, however, the, the alt-right, uh, they're quite diverse when it comes to the subject of economics, so it's certainly a topic worth exploring. Now, uh, for the record, I am not alt-right, and I say this not because... Uh, I want to disassociate myself with them because a lot of uh, actual alt-right people get quite upset when they see me uh, attempting to misrepresent the alt-right. So I am firmly alt-light, I'm not alt-right, but we are simply exploring an alt-right topic here. Uh, but uh, So now that that's out of the way, I'll welcome Steele to the show. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you for inviting me on the Unshackled show. I think it's a fantastic program. I've, I've uh, been really looking forward to coming on the show. Um, I'd like your viewers to think of me as kind of a salesperson. Uh, you know, I've been called many, th uh, many different things. Uh, you know, an I, I think of myself as an entrepreneur. But when I come on your show, kind of think of me as a salesperson, as someone selling a, a political, a philosophical idea uh, on the topic of you know, economics and the alt-right. And what I essentially want to sell to your viewers today is the idea that the alt-right, there's a whole huge fraction in the alt-right that are very uh, far left on the economic spectrum. And they don't very, they don't understand liberty very well. They don't understand this this concept of liberty. And what I, what, I, what my job is, what my priority is, is to bring those, that section and say, look, you should align much closer with the libertarian community because because the libertarian community values freedom, values consumers, values choice, and that is where wealth is made. And if you want to have a wealthy society, you want a free society. You do want a free society, and, and, and arguably, yes, it is for whites and whites only, um, depending if you're in the nationalist spectrum or the separatist spectrum or the supremacist spectrum. There's many, many different places uh, that people fall under in the alt-right, and I don't want to defend where they are, but we do want to, I, I am selling the idea of liberty. I am selling the idea that consumers are powerful, and if you push back against consumers, you are, you are ultimately going to fail. So that is my that is my mission here today. Um, yes, I, I did found the Western Workers' Party. I, th I think the Western Workers' Party is a, it's a, it's a, it's a pan-European thinking, um, it's just a near reactionary movement, and I actually have a have a, uh, a, a a a a friend in the United Kingdom who is 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 being born as we, as we speak, Mr. Neo Reactionary. But it is a near reactionary movement to to the the fascist forces of is you know Islamic terror, uh, the, the the hard left who is pushing against freedom, um, and 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 you know all, all of these other the forces. That are pushing against the West and pushing against the gates, and we are here to react against them and push back against them. Yeah, it's the the alt right. It's it's emerged as a movement. I mean, it's it's made up of what's termed the the old left, uh, the uh, what what used to be the the working class labour 
uh, voters. It's also made up of traditional national socialists, but it's also made up of ex-libertarians such as yourself and a few prominent ones over in the United States, obviously, uh, Chris Christopher Cantwell and Mike Enoch, who are still, uh, capitalism still in important to them, but they've definitely taken uh, the issues of uh, immigration and the plight of whites as sort of, that's become the top priority for them. Absolutely. So if you want to talk about traditional, uh, we'll talk about ex-libertarians first. So there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot of, there's a lot happening between the jump between where people ha started out. Uh, personally, I started out in the Ron Paul campaign of 2008. I was uh, very much into the, the whole libertarian scene, uh, very pro-freedom, very anti-big government, very big anti-big government projects. Uh, I'm talking about welfare, healthcare, I'm talking about you know roads. I'm talking about all sorts of issues that we always normally talk about. Uh, very very firm on the privatization and individual freedom aspect of those things. And I spawned into the Ron Paul campaign on these ideas. Now, as we've gone forward, a lot of people who I found in the Ron Paul campaign and things are reactionaries from say George W. Bush, and they 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 found themselves you know. They didn't quite understand what was going on with the George W. Bush. They're not Christians. They're not conservatives. Or maybe they were Christians or maybe they were conservatives. There was this whole bubble of people who found themselves agreeing with Ron Paul, but yet again, they had a whole new framework of mind. And so we, we, we stumbled into the 2012 campaign and we kept that traction up because we had a leader. We had someone to, to, to rally around, namely Ron Paul, who was very much on this train that let's let's do this let's understand this let's uh, let's push forward the the idea of liberty let's ring the liberty bell across the western nations you know unfortunately the demoralization came when we couldn't even get Mitt Romney who was a classical conservative uh, Mormon conservative into the White House and we had instead a second Obama term now this was very demor demoralizing for most of the natural conservatives as well as as well as this new brand of people who, who was emerging. A lot of these new brand of people, the alt-right people, uh, this sort of lower class, they're, rea they're reacting to the conservative movement um, born from the 50s, right? So when we had this, the, the switch around from the Republicans and the Democrats in the 50s, where the Republicans began to represent business, you know, it's taken 50 years, but people are st finally starting to revolt from within the Republican Party in the United States, and I'm talking from the United States context. They're starting to finally revolt against this idea that that big business is a good idea because a lot of them are, are small business people. They're shopkeepers, they're shop owners, they're entrepreneurs, they're um, you know they're 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 intellectuals, and they feel the crush of the Republican Party. They feel the weight of the Republican Party being anti-business because it's pro-business business. So there was all these reasons, as well as the rise of immigration and demographic decline, uh, economic uh, economic issues that was emerging, was this huge group of people that didn't identify with the Reaganites or the George Bushes or the Obamas or anybody like this. And it was a huge clunk of people and they've sort of folded themselves and put themselves into this section they call the alt-right. And that's where I stand today. I stand today as somebody who's merged over, and I, and I talked about this from with Libertarian Realists, I've merged over from the Libertarian into the alt-right because I actually see the alt-right as a mechanism for defending freedom, for defending freedom of speech, for defending values that we hold dear as Libertarians. Yeah, so, uh, certainly that's uh, how the, the alt-right has definitely come about because the left have just got so out of control with their attempt to basically basically say that our whole society it's built on uh, racism, misogyny, uh, homophobia, all, all uh, other types of, of bigotry, and that's sort of brought this uh, grand coalition together of uh, both the old left, national socialists, and of course ex-libertarians. So we've we've talked about how the various groups came together over the past. Uh, past five years. Now let's move on to the sales job on, on sell, um, I guess, selling alt-right people on the imp importance of free market economics. And as, as you said, it's, it's not about supporting big business. I mean, we're just as uh, skeptical of big, big business as everybody else. But let's start with uh, the welfare state. Now, uh, 
issues like such as healthcare, education, and social security. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because well, probably the most prominent uh, alt-right uh, personality, Richard Spencer, has been on the record as endorse endorsing universal healthcare and public education. And Donald Trump, for example, won't touch uh, social security. He's, his heart's not really in repealing and replacing Obamacare with a free market alternative. So how does, how should, how does the alt-right approach the welfare, welfare state and welfare spending? So what Richard Spencer is arguing for is he he is arguing for power when he promotes this sort of uh, one payer healthcare system. So if we're talking about healthcare, he 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 advocates and he's put out Twitter. Mike Cernovich the same thing. Uh, I want one uh, you know one one payer healthcare. Uh, I I personally believe that this is a political move within the United States um, and it doesn't affect the outlying. Uh, majority of uh, European and Western countries. Uh, what I mean by that is, I, I I believe that he would support that to grow his base, okay? Because he's appealing to the Bernie reactionaries in the United States. So you had the in the in the uh, campaign uh, that we've just lived through with the Donald Trump people on one side and the Bernie Sanders people on the other side. A lot of those people had a lot of crossovers, okay? Actually, I saw this very disturbing, for example, I, I saw this very disturbing um, video of, um, I think it was BDSM or, or some, some sort of uh, lady who has started a business in, in reaction to natural market forces uh, that promotes the whipping of repentant Trump supporters who now feel bad for voting for Trump, etc. If you see, because there's a lot of, the, and you know, the, the, this this particular man who was on this Vice documentary thing, and I saw, he he was a Bernie supporter, and he came over into the Trump camp, and he voted for Trump, and now he's repenting and he wants to go back into the Bernie camp. Uh, my my point with this is that the the, the Bernie people on healthcare and the Trump people on healthcare, national security, um, a whole bunch of issues had a lot of crossover. They had a lot of crossover, especially against elites, okay? So the Bernie people thought, oh, if we elect Bernie Sanders, we can push back against the elites, both the corporate elites, the wealthy elites, and the political elites all at the same time. The Trump people thought, in a, in a roundabout way, the same thing. Trump marketed himself as a roundabout character that would push back against Goldman Sachs, not embrace them, not fill his cabinet up with people from Goldman Sachs, um, you know, for example. Um, so there was a lot of crossover between these two campaigns. As for um, as for Richard Spencer, I think he's pandering to these Bernie reactionaries and trying to pull them over to essentially quote unquote red pill them. So come over to my healthcare deal, and then if you do want to agree with me, then you have to agree with my views on immigration, on white decline, on all the other things. So I think that that is primarily where he's going. I say this as somebody in a new rising form of the alt-right, and we call ourselves alt-right capitalists, ARCs, okay, alt-right capitalists. And we are here, we, we don't agree with the Richard Spencer movement. We don't agree that one-payer healthcare and socialized healthcare is the way to go. We agree that private healthcare, privatized, uh, you know, privatized the, the healthcare system is the way to go. Um, we, we, we push back against Richard Spencer on that notion. But we also agree with him to pull those those people over, and we would agree with him if he did take power. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it it makes sense. I mean, you've put out a justification for it, but I guess when he when he does uh, say put out tweets such as that, Richard Spencer, it's it's quite demoralising for uh, libertarians who are sympathetic to the alt right that he would say something which is so big government and if you recall uh, only about eight years ago i mean there was a real when obamacare was being passed there was a real revolt against uh, universal uh, single-payer health care and so it's that's why it's demoralizing to these people because we were nearly there, there was a movement there for free market health care and to see you know the new new right new new people of the right uh not adhere to that, that that somewhat diminishes their faith in the movement. Absolutely. And the 
uh, one of the big topics I like to talk about on, on, on my interviews is the absolute distortion of this left-right spectrum. Okay, so we have a left, we have a right, we have a spectrum. We also have it on a quadrant where you're authoritarian on the top and you know anarchistic slash libertarian on the bottom. And this this notion is being absolutely distorted in nowadays. Many people uh, agree with very far left ideas and take a lot of very far right ideas and they're smashing them together. Now it's very hard to start putting people onto a spectrum and start um, you know. Uh, saying, oh, I fit on this part of the spectrum or this part of the quadrant, because there are a lot of crossovers. Even me as an alt-right capitalist, an ARC, um, I do not agree that socializing healthcare is a good idea. I am very much in favor of privatizing healthcare. That's it. Done. Question resolved. But you know, in, in terms of this movement, you know, uh, in terms of what Richard Spencer have done, has done, it definitely is a power play and it's very appealing to many within the United States who are facing these issues. See, this is, this is where the, there, there is, le this is a domestic issue for Richard Spencer and this doesn't leak out into broader alt-right movements in Europe or in Australia or in New Zealand, etc. This, this, this doesn't leak. Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, get what you're saying there, and, and I guess it's representative of uh, free market economics as a whole, is that we're, we're so far from achieving uh, free market healthcare and uh, private education as well, that it's, it's sometimes difficult to expect that uh, the, the people who are out there trying to make the pitch to the masses to sell them on the complete free market package there and there. Yeah, absolutely. So if we talk about, like, let's say uh, traditional national socialism for, for a second, let's, let's have a look at what traditional national socialists talk about in this realm. Now, they, they actually, it's interesting, they, they, come from, they come from very left, okay, they're a very left wing, they, they enjoy socialism, they don't mind a bit of intervention, etc. But the other thing that they don't understand, and I don't think people understand, is, is that through their collective mindset, their main focus is through the individual. You know, they, 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 the, a national socialist ideology, and I'm not a national socialist, but I, 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 I know many that are, and they appeal to these, and there's crossovers between them and the alt right. They have an ideology of life. They, they think about themselves as the primary unit, same as libertarians, and because that, this is where a lot of um, libertarians and alt-right people have crossed over is that the alt-right thinks about the unit of the self as very, very fundamental and very important. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the ideas on immigration and things that they do. Then they think next of the family unit as a fundamental stronghold because the family unit is supporting the street, it's supporting the town, it's supporting the community, it's supporting the city, and it's supporting the nation because it all runs back to can you support the nation? Okay, so this is what traditional uh, sort of uh, national socialist thinking is. The national socialists also try to eliminate the, the, the discrepancies and the trials and tribulations between class structures. So they try and, they try and eliminate those structures by putting people through regimes. So, so if you're a very rich person born into a national socialist environment, because remember, national socialists are not against private property, just like the alt-right should never be against private property. As soon as you become against private property, you cannot call yourself on the alt-right. That is a communist idea, go away from us, we don't want you, you can go and do something else. But private property is a fundamental right of liberty and it's a fundamental right to all people. Uh, and, and, and the traditional national socialists are very much in favour. They should be, if they have any allegiance to traditional national socialism, to private property rights. They try and eliminate this through uh, economic justice, this class struggle between rich and poor. They um, they try and pro they are also against they are against communism on the far left, and they're against capitalism, just like the just like the alt right is. The the communism is in effect, an, ab an abolishment of private property rights, private property law. 
alt-right will never stand for that. If you do, you're out, you're gone. You're not, you can't consider yourself alt-right anymore. It doesn't matter. If, if, if there are people within your society that you don't agree to have, that have rights to, to own be mass mass shareholders. So if there's a if there's an ethnicity that you don't like, and they're the majority shareholders, or they're the majority uh, population in a de demographic population in an area, you have a right to push back against that, or you have a right to argue against that. And this goes for all people across the world. Um, uh, but you don't have a right to say you to deny them of their right to own that. You can figure out mechanisms and structures to push back against that just like any economic system, any natural force system, but you don't have the right to deny them that structure. Um, they also, they deny, you know, they, they are socialist, traditional national socialists are socialists without the international side of things. So they say, um, we can produce our own stuff. They try and defy the laws of economics. They try and defy them. They try and say we can specialize in everything. We can do everything ourselves. We can, we can, we can, we can. Um, if you look at any sort of Adam Smith, any sort of Milton Friedman, any sort of Friedrich Hayek, any sort of Ludwig von Mises, anything, any sort of Thomas Sowell, anyone you want to go to, you cannot defy these international laws. You can't. But people will try, and national socialists will try. And the problem with national socialism, it will end in war. It will end in war because they eat them, they eat their own resources up, they consume themselves to bits, and then they need to expand. And that's where you get the war. The alt-right, I don't think the alt-right should fundamentally disagree with international trade. This is a very, very dangerous and bad idea. This could end in very violent uh, and very problematic international and some as somebody who does international relations and geopolitics this can end in very very bad situations especially for a, a, a the western civilization which is so fragmented both internally and externally so you, you if you go down that path you 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 will end up in, in a in, in some big strife um they do put protectionism first and we will probably talk about protectionism in a bit but yeah, in terms of uh, traditional national socialists, there is a lot of crossover and there's also a lot of issues that we have uh, between the alt-right and national socialists. Uh, I, I, it's good that you made that distinction there that private property is still uh, a key issue for all should be for alt-right people because that is also one of the, the bedrock uh, foundations of libertarianism as well. Now, I wanted to talk next about uh, government regulation. Now, uh, obviously, uh, we've seen the Trump administration get rid of uh, environmental and energy restrictions. Uh, this is part of, uh, as we saw recently in the news, he's with Trump has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, he said he wants to uh, help. Uh, he was elected to help Pittsburgh, not Paris. So really wanting to uh, kickstart uh, energy production in America, which helps uh, reduce uh, cost of living and stimulates businesses. So there, there, and he's also uh, said that for every regulations that that's introduced, he wants uh, to repeal. So he's got a pretty solid anti-regulation message. But the the alt right is not completely anti-regulation. They they still have some concerns when it comes to uh, public safety, labor laws, and also uh, on what types of businesses are allowed to operate. Absolutely. And uh, on public safety, I think, I think the alt-right thinks of public safety in terms of uh, efficiency. I would argue that down, if you go into the depths of the alt-right thinking, <clears throat> it's in terms of efficiency and history. Public safety, should should be there to make the process as efficient as possible, so that you can maximise outcomes. And I think, I think that, like in, in my own understanding of the alt right, in my own understanding of public safety, the individual, the worker unit, the working person, is extremely valuable to the operation. Because if they're not valued, if they're not valued, and they get hurt or they get killed, then you lose not only an economic unit, not only a life, not only a racial unit, not only a demographic unit, not only, but also that because the alt-right does value social, uh, you know, social, uh, a, a social safety net, 
it becomes a burden. So I think on public safety, the alt-right is extremely, um, you know, forward in terms of state intervention on public safety. I think they, they, in my, in my own, uh, in my own interpretation, they're a little bit too forward on public safety. I think they get in, into the market a little bit too much on public safety because they do value these individuals a little bit too highly in terms of public safety. They don't allow enough, uh, you know, economic force to, uh, to, to, to sort it out, itself out. But they do, they do uh, value them very highly. Yeah. On climate change, um, they are very mm, sort of liberal on the idea. They're very, um, they're very open to science because the, the reason they have to be open to science on climate change and I'm talking real science, I'm not talking about pseudoscience or anything else, I'm talking real science, is because of the racial aspect. Because every time you talk about the IQ levels or racial differences or whatever, the alt-right will be very quick to go, here are the statistics on black and white crime, here are the statistics on racial IQ, here are the statistics, here are the stats, stats, science, science. They'll bash science into your head, okay? But if they come back at you with that with climate change, they can't do it. Because they can't, on one hand, say science is the 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 be all and end all for racial IQ and demography, etc., and then turn around and say, well, we don't believe in science in terms of climate change. They don't do that. They believe in science. They're a par party of reason, of rationale, and of science. So, on science, they defer to scientists. They defer to statistics. But they also do argue on that. They push back against it. They say, well, is this change variable over billions of years and millions of years, you know, it, 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 and, and, and in terms of how much CO2 and, and et cetera has been pumped in by humans? Is it variable to humans and stuff like that? They defer to the science. They're very scientifically, uh, they think of the scientific method. They defer to the scientific method. On trading hours, um, the, they want a 24-hour economy. There's no doubt about it. They want to leave it up to every single business to decide when they can open and when they can close. They don't care. Are you, are you, they sure, don't care. Are you sure about that? Because I have seen, or oh, although he's, he wouldn't define himself as alt-right, he's more of a paleo-libertarian, Mark Dice has decried uh, you know, consumerism and all, all the, all the uh, Black Friday t uh, type uh, type sales and uh, there, there are some on the alt right who think that uh, things should be closed on Sunday because that's the, the, the day of worship and they, they think that the 24 hour economy is damaging to morality. Oh, absolutely. And they take this, they take this idea from Jonathan Bowden who spawned this idea. Jonathan Bowden, who, who took it from, you know, uh, uh, other intellectuals, but Jonathan Bowden mainly promoted this idea that the 24-hour economy was a really bad idea, that we have to go to back to Christian thinking. And and, and look, I, I, I say in a lot, I, I agree with John and Bowden on a lot of things, but I also disagree because as as somebody who's a, who doesn't, is not a Christian, I am not a Christian. I am a, a what you would call a cosmotheist. That's irrelevant. My religious beliefs are irrelevant. But I don't, I don't, I don't bow over to this, Western Christian narrative, which seems to go very strong, very hand in hand in the alt right. I think the alt right should be open to more things than just a Western Christian narrative. Or obviously, I believe in Western supremacy. I 100% believe in that. I would not, I would not defer from that. I wouldn't pull back from that idea. But what I do pull back from, and what I do challenge, is Christian supremacy, because by by only promoting Christian ideas, you isolate a lot of people. I would leave the alt right. This very minute, I'll take my tie off and go if they reject me because I'm not a Christian. So when the Christian segment of the alt right, which is a very strong, very powerful segment, and I will, I will, I will admit it, that it is a very powerful segment, comes in and, and bosses me about should my business be open on Sunday, I will say I reject your morality, I reject your moral authority, I reject your consequence, and I will have my business open. This is why I'm a new breed of alt-right, alt-right capitalists, where we as entrepreneurs and as business people are pushing back, even within the alt-right, against that sort of thinking. We, we, th we, 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 we think that we have to compete with the world uh, in terms of money, in terms of tax. We're a very competition-driven uh, section of the alt-right. We have to compete with them in terms of moral authority, um, all sorts of things, we, we, a whole spectrum of things. But 
we we don't deny that um, we we don't deny that there is that section in the alt right, that Christian section that pushes against us. But I would argue, wake up to yourselves. Sunday trading is not a bad idea. Yeah, and certainly there is a strong economic case for oh, seven, seven days, 20, 24 hours a day, but these uh, these other elements, the alt-right, they're all going to say, oh, but there's all these externalities, moral costs that uh, you're not counting as well. But the, the other subject that I wanted to uh, touch on is labour laws. Now, obviously, the alt-right, they're very concerned about the, the plight of the... Well, the, the white working class, and so obviously repealing, advocating the repeal of labour regulations is, uh, like, uh, some people on the alt right recoil in horror at that, saying, "How can you uh, open them up to more exploitation?" So, how do you handle that objection? How do I handle that objection? Well, in terms of labour laws, I think that that businesses find mechanisms to protect their workers. I think that workers are the fundamental uh, production unit for a business, okay? So consumers are the most important aspect of a business. The consumers pay the wages, consumers pay the business inputs, consumers pay the costs, they and, 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 and consumers make the profits. Now, if you have a consumer as the king dictating dictating where their resources flow to, uh, to dictating where their resources flow to where their money flows to then you have so for example okay let's give you a very uh, sort of brief but but okay example and uh, Google okay Google so highly values its employees that it gives them slides it gives them the best healthcare cover it gives them the best security mechanisms it absolutely worships its its uh, employees and it makes it the best environment it wants to live with them it gives them free housing it gives them everything because it absolutely values those employees because they have knowledge inside their heads which is totally dependent on the company's existence okay I think most businesses are like this um, for there are units of exchange so, for example, if you have a cash register, person at a, at a cash register, you can take and swap and change these people. Um, um, the alt-right would argue that white people would do better than other races at doing this particular job. Their, tr their trust is higher, their IQ is higher, you could change them quicker. Those people would figure out how to get out of that job quicker and go off and be an entrepreneur and go off and start their own business and things. This is where the right alt-right would come in and says, it's why uh, you know waves of immigration is a bad thing, but in terms of labor laws, I, personally, I think the business finds mechanisms to protect its employees because it has to to ensure profits, and we want profits. Businesses love profits; they love making money. That's their incentive to to please the customer to make money. So labor laws are important. Um, I I would recoil a little bit at a little bit, not too much. I would recall a little bit of protectionism, because like if you shut a plant and immediately, like a like a say a Ford plant or a you know in Australia we have a Holden plant or in America Chrysler plant or something, you send it to China. On one hand, the in, the goods you're importing are of a higher value, and all you do have to do is pay, print paper currency to import that. So on one hand. All of those people who lost their job in the United States, for example, and only in the United States because they do have the US dollar, are actually benefiting from that Ford plant being shut down. And this was a big thing that was that was promoted by, say, Bill Clinton, right? And Bill Clinton went through and he did NAFTA and he did all these free trade deals. So did um, Obama and they did all these free trade deals where they relied on this US dollar system to import cheaply made, higher value goods where you could just print dollars for it. But I think that sort of that sort of system is now folding. I think that sort of system is now coming to an end and we have to start looking for that, that way to protect those workers, protect those white workers, especially in the industrial sectors which have collapsed, to give them jobs, to give them um, and reignite them with community spirit and with with patriotism and nationalism and, and things which will take their minds away. Um, 
and this this is the sort of new labor laws. It's an intellectual uh, it's an intellectual revolution where the new labor laws are now going internal. They don't we don't worry about the factory anymore. We're not worried about the production process or the supermarket or whatever. I think that that era is dying, especially in somewhere like the United States. Well, let's talk about uh, free trade now, because I know it's a topic that I can tell you're dying to talk about. Now, obviously, uh, there's been a swing swing back to protectionism, which has obviously uh, been represented in the election of Donald Trump and also uh, Marine Le Pen in her presidential uh, bid uh, t talked about the uh, Downs uh, re really recalled against uh, globalization. Now, the reason I think there's been this swing towards protectionism is because the, there's been a really poor case being made for free trade um, recently, and I think libertarians are guilty of that as well. Because it seems to be when they're explaining the benefits of free trade, they 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 don't uh, they don't acknowledge the the hardships that that come with. Uh, free trade and globalization, and even Australian economist Robert Murphy, for example, has been guilty of this when he says that of oh, the you know workers who lose their jobs in the Rust Belt states, oh you know they'll just find new jobs, and he just says it'll just sort of magically happen, and it's like well yeah. If you look at you know the Rust Belt, Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Michigan, these new jobs aren't magically uh, appearing. So I think that's why we've seen this uh, swing back to protection, and also because the free, the way that free trade is being pursued, it's empowered uh, globalist bodies and also supernatural bodies such as uh, World Trade Organization and you know these really long trade agreements, which are like thousands of pages long, uh, which is yeah, which is completely different from unilateral free trade, which libertarians are uh, uh, in favour of. So do you agree that this, uh, I, guess, I guess you'd say, rebellion against free trade is because of poor sales personship? Well, absolutely. I think, I think that one of the core pro the proponents on the alt-right is globalism versus nationalism versus they, they, the the, the alt-right sees themselves as nationalist fundamentally and they oppose these globalist forces that are holding them down. Now, on free trade, I think it's very interesting because what, on some levels I agree with free trade and I agree with internationalization. I do, absolutely. I think that, especially in the United States, talking about the United States, they do get a better deal at times, especially sometimes, where they can just print dollars because I, th I, don't, I think a lot of people just ignore this fact where they can just print dollars and import goods, right? That's uh, For me, that sounds like a lot better deal where you can offshore, so you, you, can, you can take your, uh, your, your, your plant, which is producing enormous amounts of CO2 and deadly gases and poisons and, 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 and it disrupts your workers and, 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 and it can kill people, you just put that in another country. And you import those good goods, right? So you can get, you can have Yosemite, you can have, you can have national parks, you can have these things because you don't have a big uh, plant sitting there producing gases and fumes and 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 putting the people in hospital and all that sort of stuff. So on one hand, I agree with it. On the other hand, the problem is, especially since the WTO, is that the free trade agreements have been rigged for corporations. For the big, for the big players, and not for everybody. And that is where the problem. That's where the problem is. So, th and that's the that's the that's the that's the top of the problem, where this cortocracy, this elite of of mega, because, again, bringing it back to the currency, the U.S. dollar. The reason, not only the reason that the most uh, co corporate entities have been born in the United States, but was because of the US dollar, not only because of the high IQ of white people and things, but also because <clears throat> because the, the biggest consumer base in the United States, well, in the world, has been the United States because of the US dollar. Now, in the political process in, in Washington, in the Congress, in the, in the Senate, and in the President, the big corporations, Coca-Cola, Ford, uh, you know, Monsanto, they, all these big ones, all the coal, everyone, they have been colluding to make the deal better for them and not for the smaller corporations and not for the mom and pop shops. 
So what happens even on a business level, even on a, a business level, the mom and pop shops, the smaller corporations, everybody gets left out in the dark and you have a collusion between government and corporations which come together using the US dollar as their intertwining mechanism and using currency exchange and currency manipulation through the Federal Reserve and through the Treasury Agreement and through the SOC and other things to enforce this sort of top-down tyranny, right? which is what we call nowadays, which, has been, which is the reason, like you said, it's been sold incorrectly, is because it's free trade. It's not free trade. It's cronyism. It's corporatism. It's a distortion of free market enterprise. And everybody gets ripped off of this. Domestic, domestic players in the United States, domestic players in Australia, China gets ripped off by this, India gets ripped off with this, you, you, uh, the, the, the European Union, uh, everybody in Europe, all the businesses in Europe, everybody gets ripped off by this collusion at the top between big, big corporations, mega corporations and the government. So that is where the alt-right comes in and says, hang on. People like myself on the alt-right capitalist, we say not all globalization is bad, but this sort of cronyism is terrible. This sort of cronyism is destroying the worker. This sort of cronyism is ripping people off. It's polluting the environment. It's destroying the currency. And we've got to, we've got to address this. Yeah, and so I've, I haven't been impressed with the way that libertarians have, have carried on uh, with this uh, re resistance to free trade. They're saying uh, it's you know really good because of uh, because of comparative advantage, and you know you sh you all should know this, and you're all stupid for believing this, and they don't, they they don't convince anyone. Where I think the us or who come from a libertarian background. Uh, have yeah have realized that no this is not what free trade is about and understanding uh, or working people's concerns about how the system's currently working yeah absolutely comparative advantage you know uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, economic theories that just spawned from Adam Smith the great Adam Smith actually and I and I and I am I'm not going to retract from Adam Smith because like uh, another thing is if you're if you're if you're somebody who for example who wants to return to the British Empire? Well, Adam Smith tried to stop the dismantling of the British Empire. He wrote in in Wealth of Nations a, a few months before uh, before the the 1776 before the uh, re revolution that you shouldn't try mercantilism and you shouldn't try protectionism on and you shouldn't try to tax the colonies out of out of their freedom because they're going to revolt. They're going to, you know, you, you push somebody's buttons too many times. It's very simple. You push somebody too far and they revolt. They, they retract, they disobey, they go awry. And Adam Smith actually tried to say to the, the British elites in, in Parliament at the time, if you go ahead and if you put the tea tax on, if you put all of these taxes on, you're going to lose, the, you're going to lose the, the, the colony of the United States. And that's exactly what happened. So I would argue to some of the people in the alt-right who are all for empire and all for this and all that, learn some lessons from Adam Smith. Learn some lessons from economics that you're going to lose things if you don't allow people to trade and interact. You're going to lose things. You're going to lose it. You're going to lose it big time. Um, and and, and, and you know, if, you, if you thought that America breaking away was a good idea, well, you know that's a, that then that that's good for you, but you know America wouldn't have become uh, a great powerful player without its constitution, which involved a, a lot of freedom. Let's move on to uh, another subject now. There, now there is a, a bit of a Keynesian streak in the the alt right as well. I mean, for example, Trump has pledged to spend. Uh, billions more uh, building up America's uh, infrastructure and uh, a traditional National Socialist Party such as uh, One Nation here in Australia, uh, they, they do have support for the state ownership of assets and, uh, and oppose uh, privatisation. Uh, so where do you, uh, how do you, do you see this as a problem? So I wouldn't I wouldn't call Trump alt right at all. I would call him a I would call him a neoconservative. I would call him a Barack Obama 2.0. I wouldn't call uh, tr uh, tr Donald Trump at all alt right. He's civic nationalist. He's an empirist. He's no no way associated with the alt right. As in um, as in for protectionism and buying up firms. I think I think what they're going along with the deal here. I think what the deal is this is 
is again, it's a pushback. It's using the state to push back against globalism. So, for example, you talk to some of the people on, for example, in Australia, it would be the Liberal Party in the United States. It would be, uh, you know, the Republican Party in the UK. It would be the Conservatives. If you talk to them and you said, oh, you know, would you like your firm or your farm or your factory to be sold off to Chinese or Indians or, or et cetera, or blah, 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 whoever, um, uh, would you like that to happen? Well, they, 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 they sit there and they go, oh, well, let's, uh, let's evaluate the cost and the benefit and the amount of money we'll make and the amount of tax we'll make over time. And I think what the rise of One Nation and these protectionist people are is says, no, instead of, instead of allowing people to trade and, and sell off goods and assets, let's just let the state buy them let's, let's, or, or overtake them or hoard them or whatever. Let's take the, let the state hoard them, hoard these assets so that they don't end up in foreign hands and they'll never come back. I think that is the protectionist mode of what these parties are pushing forward. I think they they are saying and they're arguing that if the state, if the Australian government, uh, the US government, the Canadian government, the United Kingdom government, etc., buys these assets, hoards these assets, and keeps them off the market, then then uh, entrepreneurs and business owners and and, and farmers and, and whoever else won't sell them to the highest builder, which is going to be a, an external foreign uh, entity yeah it's, it's certainly i think the the main thing we we need to stress to uh people in the alt-right that uh, and we've we've gone through this all, all throughout the show is that uh globalism is is not capitalism it's you know we we as uh, adherers of the free market we don't want everything controlled by a central body or an elite so it's we understand that uh, you know you do you don't like you know globalism and these uh, cronious corporations controlling things but the reason why they're empowered so much is because of the state not because of the capitalist system itself yeah, we, we, myself and libertarian realists were talking about this. I think it was it's this infinite cycle where where if you give the people freedom, the free the, the freedom that you give the people, that well, there's a debate on whether the state gives or protects rights, and we can talk about that. But let's just assume that they give people freedom because they naturally want to take rights. Okay, I, I'm just going to assume that we we can talk about that if you want. But if you give the people freedom, if you allow them to have freedom, they generate wealth. And then the amount of wealth that they generate, the state then can tax and consume and skim off the top. Now, the, the, main, the main debate in politics is how much, how much can we skim off? Can we skim off 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%? And I would argue to, to the people in the alt-right is that if you want real hardcore socialism, if you want to go down that path, look at Venezuela. They're a, a, you know, a, a sort of... Hegem, you know, they're an ethnically homogenous country. It's kind of like what you want. They are very, they're in a lot of strife right now. Cuba, another thing, very homogenous country, one, one culture, one people. You want to live like that? That's what you're going to end up with. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, okay, the USSR, homogenous in, in, in most respects, homogenous, culturally pretty much one, one similar culture, completely different system to the United States, completely different system um, to, to capitalism and to freedom, collapsed, absolutely uh, collapsed, doesn't exist anymore. It's, 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 it's gone, all right? So there's, no, there's not much point in trying to revert to a system that always collapses on itself. It's try, it's, it, the point is, find where you don't like, find the differences in the current situation, find what you want to argue about, but leave some things alone because some things that you leave alone, for example, freedom and, and the ability to conduct business and stuff, these things are going to benefit you in the long run anyway. And, and it's, it's worth pointing out that over the past, uh, past 20 years, because of globalization, we have seen many you know, major corporations of global players crumble be, because they, they just can't handle you know, not, not being... Uh, not being propped up by government and local economies, and that's empowered ordinary people to set up their their own businesses and work for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So if you if you've got a position where a, a corporate giant cannot any longer, it's not producing a, a a good or a service that the people don't want. 
there is no point propping up that service. You're literally wasting money. You're literally wasting money. And the other thing the alt-right has to understand is coming into coming into the economics world with a knife, it's like coming in, it, it, coming you're coming in with a knife and not a gun. Okay, you're coming you're coming into a place where you, if you don't like diversity, the, I'm sorry, but the economics world, the shareholder world, and all that sort of stuff is the most diverse place you're going to find. You know, there's, no, there's not more diversity because, um, as Ben Shapiro, you know, not exactly on the same line as Ben Shapiro, but as Ben Shapiro says, money only sees green. It only sees green. It doesn't see black or white or conservative or liberal or, or you support abortion or you don't. It doesn't see any of that unless that's your business. Then it sees that. But that's a very specific business model. For the most part, people are only choosing goods and services, right? They're choosing product A or product B or product C or product D. So if you if you want to battle in this arena, you're gonna you're gonna have to come in with a gun to the gunfight. You're not gonna have to come in with a pistol. I mean, with a with a knife to the gunfight, um, because you're gonna get destroyed. You're gonna get beaten back. You you know. There's things like currency. There's things like choice. There's things like incentives. There's things like um, there's things like uh, there's there's a ton of there's a whole world of things in there that they have no idea a lot of the time what they're talking about, and because they have this one set notion, and it's going to destroy them in the long run. And another thing we need to stress to alt right people is that. And it's very dangerous to entrust the state with power. And the reason why libertarians stress the case for limited government is because if you enlarge the state, then your en your enemies, when they get in charge of government, will use it for, for their own ends, for, for things that, that you don't like. And it's funny now that... Uh, the, the left are now realizing that they they like a limited government because in response to Trump uh, withdrawing from the, the Paris Climate Accord, all these uh, governors from all these liberal states are saying, well, we'll set our uh, you know own emissions reduction targets, which for me, who favors decentralization, is like, fine, if you want to run your state like that, that's fine. Uh, Trump is doing of uh, you know what's best for for the country as a whole. So I so I think that we need we also need to say that uh, by limiting government, we're empowering individuals, and uh, for for the alt right, that means you know empowering you know re-empowering white people to make sure they're in control of their destiny. That to empower them, we need to reduce government because look at how how much we we suffered under the eight years of Obama. Absolutely, and so the core the core message that the alt right needs to drive home, and the core message that I bring, is this is a cultural war. You're in a cultural war. the The war is culture. The war is ethnicity. The war is uh, the war is for Western civilization and things like this. This isn't a this isn't about this isn't about um, you know don't 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 worry about too much about allowing the government to do this and that because because on the on the most part we're we're outnumbered on that uh, on on most fronts anyway we're actually outnumbered and outgunned we, we're running out of money on most parts um our, our cities and our infrastructure and, and and most parts of of throughout the west are, are in decline anyway and you can't even go to an what's the name area on the grande concert anymore without getting blown up so you're in you're in you're on the retreat so, so my point, my point is exactly, exactly right. Um, for someone who who, who, cha who champions decentralization, you know what Trump did with the Paris Climate Agreement is is, is fantastic. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. It's, it, it, you can't have. See, if you have a national standard, if you have a national standard, how are you going to, um, how you, how do you, how do you pit the coal company against the, you know, water treatment plant versus the hairdresser? versus the baker versus me and you. Do you know what I mean? There's no, it, it doesn't make sense. Having a having statewide, uh, state 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 legislatures set their own targets means that consumers and firms and things like that can move about and 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 there's freedom of choice between 50 different states in the United States, for example, to move and and to do business and to and to conduct. Within those legislatures and those agreements, and 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 just unpack this idea on a mass scale on all things. I mean, it's not it's not that hard. But the primary battle for the alt right is ethnicity and culture. I mean, that's it. Stay in those realms. Um, don't worry too much about economics. 
And it's, it's de- you're definitely right in talking, talking about that it is a, a cultural battle that we're in which most of the time has nothing to do with government. I mean, for example, uh, the, the mainstream media, the, the Hollywood elite, I mean, that's, that's nothing to do with, with government. Uh, that's, oh, they, there's a, they do support big government, but uh, they're completely independent of government and they're influencing the culture. That's something that we... We need to need to fight just just by ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of a lot of a lot of Hollywood is is essentially Jewish controlled, right? And 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 Jews have a very um, they have they have a lot of critical uh, critical critical assertions on Western civilization, and and a lot of the people in the alt right revere that, and they just you know it, it, revere that is in they they think all right, let's make our own. Sort of, let's take our own Hollywood. Let's push back in this cultural way. Let's influence the culture in our own sort of way. And this is where, again, where the, the alt right and the National Socialists then again align. They say, you know, let's bring back the family. Let's bring, let's bring back this notion of life. That life is exciting. That I can do something for my family. That does something for the town. That does something for the nation, etc. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that. I would say that that that. The, the Hollywood elites and the cultural elites of this generation is what you want to be pulling down. Um, you, 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 you want to focus your energy and attention on building new systems that can challenge the old and pull the old down. If you look at movie sales, if you look at movie records and, and things, they're collapsing. The internet has definitely killed that monopoly. Um, it's, 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 it's on its way out. The movie, yeah, you know, so... You can take advantage of this if you really want to. You can you can definitely take advantage of this. And also, I might add that the the fight back against groups like Antifa that that doesn't involve governments at all. I mean, that's just uh, ordinary people taking to the streets saying, you know, we're not going to let you just come up and beat us up. Lots and lots of uh, revolutionary vigilantes in the United States. Uh, uh, revolutionary conservative, I, if anybody knows him, go and uh, check his channel out, go and check his Facebook out, revolutionary conservative. Very similar lines to the alt-right, very similar. He, he wants to revolt against the established system to remake a conservative system that he thinks and that they think the United States used to be based on. They, and they agree with this for the whole Western world. Or there's people like Ken Reed um, over there, and uh, you can go and look at Ken Reed's work, and he, you know, he goes out and he just pushes a back against Antifa and the communists in the United States on the ground, uh, and he's making great progress in that in that area. Um, Antifa is a, is interesting because Antifa is um, it argues against fascism um, while being very fascist itself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I saw. I saw. I know that's a generic thing nowadays, but I saw. I saw this one post uh, where the man. It was in uh, London in a borough, or whatever they call that. And all he had on his sign was "I stand for free speech" or something like that. He said, "I stand for the right of free speech" or something. And he got. He got. He yelled at Nazis. Nazis off our street. I mean, this was horrendous stuff. I'm. I'm. I was quite shocked. You know, that all he had was "I stand up for free speech," and they said, "No platform for Nazis." You know. This sort of stuff, absolutely horrendous. So um, I would not trust Antifa with my life. I I, I I think it's right that we should push back against them. And the only problem about pushing back against a fascist organization is usually the rise of fascism to counteract fascism. And that, for me, is a, a huge issue and a huge problem, which is why I'm trying to educate the alt-right. Okay, if you want to do that, don't forget the root and don't forget how to win. Freedom is how to win. Oh, I certainly think you've you've made a, a good case uh, to to the alt right today, uh, and that's uh, we we're sort of facing the same uh, I guess problem in the the alt right as uh, you did in the libertarian movement, uh, uniting the the alt right around one manifesto. It's exactly the same in the libertarian movement, trying to bring all the, the different libertarian groups together. Yeah, that that is the challenge. That is a very big challenge. And what I try to argue to the alt right is is if you jump on board with creativity, because if you if you want to forget about creativity, well then you're going to lose. You've got to jump on board with creativity. 
You want to make money? We, you want to be greedy? You want to make money? You want to be self-interested? Come on. Why not? Come on, all right. You want to be self-interested. You want to make money. You want to think collectively. You want to think about your people, your race, your culture, you know, the white, your, your white folk and all that. So let's think about that. And let's also think about imploring and, and, and supporting freedom for those people. Because if you take away their freedom, then if, if I didn't offer you any freedom, then why would you want to join me anyway? Why would you want to join a, a, a controlling authoritarian cult? It doesn't make sense. So to me especially and to most of the libertarians out there, they wouldn't want to join that, you know. Um, most conservatives, don't worry about conservatives, alt right. Don't worry about conservatives because what conservatives will do is if you become powerful, you just make the new conservative branch. Okay? That's all that happens. Conservatives only try to conserve an old order that they can only conceive in. We're doing something creative. We're doing something exciting. We want to make money. We want to make business. We want to. We want to become powerful. You want to. You want to change the culture, alter the culture, and state a brand new culture. It's it's very exciting on the alt right. We're very young and innovative and innovative and 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 we're pushing it back. It's very exciting, but. You want to drag over these other groups, so offer them something, give them something. If you want to become a controlling, narcissistic freak, then you're gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go anywhere. Uh, that's a good note to end on. Well, thanks, still for for coming on the the show today. Thank you very much, and it's a, it's a fantastic podcast, and uh, I've got to listen to, to to more of it, and I and I definitely will. I, and we'll definitely have you back on the show in the future to maybe discuss uh, another economics topic or perhaps uh, something else. All right. Yeah. No. There's always there's always a lot of news happening on the alt right. There's always a lot of stuff going on. A lot of protests to report about. Uh, you know, we've had we've had a, we've had a few, you know Donald Trump with the head thing. We could talk about that. Where we, we we there's always a lot going on nowadays, and I think it's accelerating all the time. So very happy to come back on it in the future at some point. And um and and we live in very exciting and very fast times. I would argue. Uh, I'm glad you're you're more op optimistic than the than the previous alt right person I had on this show who was who took the black pill. All right, no, never. I never take the black pill. I always think optimistically because the alt right is about optimism, posit po It's about thinking positively and it's about thinking offensively. If you think defensively, uh, as I explained to another uh, person I was getting interviewed by, the the last stage of empire is thinking defensively. We don't want to think defensively. We want to think offensively. You think of defensively, you're thinking about the last stage of empire. We're not thinking that. We're thinking positively. We're thinking creatively. And we are thinking offensively. It's offensive thinking. And also, if you're not an alt-right person who listens to this show, I hope that you found the subject uh, informative and it broadened your horizons and shed a bit more light on the how the alt-right thinks uh, economically. So we hope to bring you more economic shows in the future along with our other new formats. So at the end of the show, uh, the usual reminders apply. Don't forget, if you haven't yet signed up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe, also, view our upcoming events at theunshackled.net slash events. Uh, please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled at theunshackled.net slash support. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube, or selected uh, episodes on Facebook video. And of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.